I guess it's the equivalent of making an email address when you're 16 and you just kind of pick a handle and then that's yeah. just what you end up with. I love that. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Why Bother, the podcast where we explore why creative people bother doing things the hard way. I'm your host, Gareth Davies from Maker House, and I'm here with an awesome guest today, Julie Lan from Science Cobs. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. So excited to chat with you about Science Cobs, about your day job as well, and how you work this side hustle into your schedule. Julie's one of the talented makers we get to work with at Maker House. Uh, she describes her business, I believe, on your website as cute and sassy, uh, stationary, and small gifts, gifts. Yeah. and small gifts. All right. Uh, and yeah, we carry your stickers, your cards, and you make the most adorable little illustrations. We're going to flash some of those on the screen for those watching on YouTube. If you're listening on Spotify or elsewhere, be sure to check out our website, uh, makerhouse.com, and you can find Julie's products. There is a link down below. You can also just search for her online, Science Cobbs, or find her on Instagram, TikTok, wherever you find your local makers. So let's dive right in. We're going to have some sure. fun. We'd like to do a little rapid fire segment called Bother or Not Bother. Okay. Those are your two options. Let's go. Pineapple on pizza. Bother. Okay. Gardening. Not bother. <laughs> All right. You're not alone. It's a lot of work for very little yield. Trust me, I garden. <laughs> um, acrobatics. Bother. I love it. I do it three, four times a week. Coffee. Bother. Every morning. Yeah. Staple. You've had your coffee today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amazing. You're bringing the energy. Uh, what about cooking or baking? <laughs> not bother. Not bother. Not bother. Does not bring joy to my life. You have other people <laughs> cooking and baking in your life? Shout out to Hello Dollies for providing me all the big pastries I don't need to bake. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's do one more here. Um, tea. You said you drink coffee. Do you drink tea? Not bother. I've never been a fan. Okay. No. okay. Well, we can agree to disagree because I don't drink coffee. Okay. Oh. <laughs> uh, and last one. Uh, swimming. Um, bother. It's a life skill, I feel yeah. like. <laughs> You'll, you won't drown. That's good. You won't drown. It's a good life skill to have. All right. Yeah. So you said you grew up doing some competitive swimming. Yeah, I did. I grew up doing competitive swimming for years and years. Multi-talented yeah. maker. So you've learned some of her skills already, <laughs> and you're going to get to know about her art business. Tell us a bit about that trajectory of going from, you know, working more of, I guess, a nine to five. And then when did you decide and why did you decide to bother starting up your own business with Science Cops? So I think the conventional thing is I've always had a nine to five, like most people. Um, but I've had a sports injury in the past where I injured myself while I was doing some hip hop and I couldn't walk for four months. So <sighs> Yeah, during that time, I got into a spiral of depression because I do acrobatics, you know, I bike, I ski, I'm very active. Mm. So I couldn't move anywhere for four months. And um, I just started doodling. And my friend just saw them and she says that they're really cute. Yeah. And she says, why don't you start an Instagram page for your doodles? Because um, it was also during COVID as well. Yeah. And it was like, you know, people kind of need some little joy and happiness right now. Absolutely. Yeah. And I was like, OK, sure. I don't know if anyone would follow it or anything. So I just started Science Cobbs on Instagram and it kind of just grew from there. And eventually she 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 asked me if I ever thought about selling greeting cards from some of like the funny doodles I do. Yeah. And I was like, no, never. But maybe I'll try that. And it took me a while because it was very scary to start something new. Yeah. But put yourself out there. Yeah. And starting anything new where you don't really have like a mentor or anyone, you just kind of have to go from scratch. It's always scary. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it was really almost accidental uh, how you stumbled into science cobs. Like, Without that injury, you probably never would have taken yeah. the time to do the artwork. And then without that friend encouraging you as well. Yeah. So it's a lot of honestly, I feel like life, a lot of things, you know, it's you think that, you know, it's awful when it happens to you. But looking back, you may have learned something or gained something from it. Like you never know where life takes you. And that's really cool. And also, I've also learned that you need to have some supportive people in your life, too. And because without her, I would not, never have thought of even just 
you know, putting my doodles online. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's awesome. Who's your friend? We got to shout them out. Uh, her name is Katarina. She actually does both view photography in Toronto. So nice. Yeah. Great job, Katarina. <laughs> Thanks for pushing Julie to do science cobs. And, uh, and we're all grateful. Our customers yeah. as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> buying up your cute products. So, thank you. um, how did you come up with sort of your, you have some characters in your doodles um, and the name too. Uh, where does the name Science Cobs come from? So I guess when I started doing it, um, we were watching a lot of <laughs> Discovery Channel things. Okay. <laughs> and Nat nature. Nature things. So we were making a lot of just nature jokes and just, you know, around us and stuff like that. And that's just kind of like the surrounding and we were thinking of corn on the cobs and the name kind of just came science cobs. Okay. Um, so it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. It's, is it just to get people guessing and thinking? I have, I have no idea, to be <laughs> honest. Um, it's kind of like, because I never thought this would grow into a full blown business. It was just something <laughs> fun. So I guess it's the equivalent of making an email address when you're 16 and you just kind of <laughs> pick a handle and then that's yeah. just what you end up with. I love that. Yeah. yeah. You're stuck with it now. Yeah. Yeah. You've already printed all your business cards <laughs> yeah. and it's out there in the world. Yeah. Uh, but it works. So, um, and is that where the characters kind of came from too? Just like watching, you know, TV during COVID or did you, are you like a, you know, a big pet lover? Yeah. We have two dogs and one cat. The dogs are all rescued. Um, and honestly, they're like, so they're my babies. I love them. Uh. So, yeah, the first couple Good of illustrations. You. Thank you. First couple of illustrations were from my dogs and just cats in the house. And then, you know, we watch a lot of Discovery Channel shows and so expanded into other parts of the animal parts, kingdom. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. With, hence the word science. Yeah. And yeah, a lot of it is just like you read things online and. Cool. That's great. And of course, folks watching or listening, uh, be sure to check out her collection because you'll see all sorts of cute animal illustrations. Uh, my next question is going to be about something specific in your business that you do the hard way. So, you know, you could maybe take a shortcut, make it a little easier on yourself, but you take the time to do it the hard way. And why do you bother doing it that way? So one of the things I do is I print my greeting cards in very small quantities and almost on demand. Okay. Um, I do it that way because I go to a local press. So oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. So I don't have something where you order from a big manufacturer where, you know, you have to get 500 or something like that. They, so. These aren't Vistaprint no, greeting cards. No, yeah. they're locally printed. Not Hallmark. Yeah. <laughs> and I do it this way because they're local so I can pick up whenever I would like. Right. And I also print per demand so I don't have to have so much storage for all my items as well. Good point. Because you're working out of your house. I assume. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, so you don't want to have like a whole room full of yeah, inventory. Exactly. And I'm sure my husband would divorce me yeah. <laughs> eventually yeah. when everything takes over. Yeah. Yeah. And I also find that smaller quantities also guarantee better for quality as well. Okay. And it's also better for them because if something messes up, they don't have to print 500, for example. They right. Just print a smaller quantity. So it works for both of us. Amazing. Yeah. And good for you to support a local printer as well. And it's great for customers to know that they're not only supporting a local artist like yourself, but... The actual product is made in Ottawa. Yeah. And I guess you guys sell them. So they're really supporting three local businesses in one. Yeah. Buying the greeting cards. So, That's yeah. amazing. That's what it's all about. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. Um, on the flip side of, of that, uh, this is something we like to ask. It's called the cost of convenience. That is something you might choose or someone else might choose to do the easy way <laughs> and, you know, saving time or money. But. What's the hidden cost to that? Once I went to a wedding and they had um, four of the same wedding cards. That's what the groom and the bride was really? commenting that four couples gave them the same wedding cards. Yeah, that, that's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that maybe a lot of people buy greeting cards from big manufacturers and, you know, they right. have a very small pool of seasonal or event cards. Yeah, they probably have like one wedding card that's actually cool. Yeah, <laughs> one other baby ones are, card. The other one ones wedding. are crap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or I find that a lot of wedding cards or even just, you know, love cards that you buy are very like cringy. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, or generic. Like, yeah. Yeah. They've been around for a long time. Yeah, people get their greeting cards often where it is most convenient, I think. So yeah. if you're at Shoppers Drug Mart, you know, 
doing your errands and you're like, oh, I got to get a card for that thing. You might buy your card there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I think that it's worthwhile to go out of your way to go to a local store to pick up a greeting card because it gives a different message and it's unique. Yeah, it'll stand out from the other four identical Hallmark greeting cards at the way. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Especially when you go to birthdays and weddings, when you have a big crowd there as well, you kind of yeah. want your stuff to kind of stand out. Yeah, so. it's kind of special. There's nothing better than if, if someone's opening your card and they're like, oh, where did you get this? Like, because yeah. it actually made them laugh or they're looking at the back and they're like, oh, it's a local company I've never heard of. So, yeah. And one that. of the joys that I have when I work markets is when someone comes up and starts reading all the cards I have, they start laughing. They're like, oh, this card will be perfect for so and so. And then, you know, they buy it. And I'm just like, oh, it's going to good use. You know, yeah, it brings a smile to someone's face. Such a good point. We hear laughter from our wall of greeting cards all the time. And it's one of the best feelings at Maker House. So, Aww. yeah. So thanks it's for great. thanks for bringing <laughs> the good great. vibes onto our walls. Uh, so we're going to take a quick break and then we'll be back with the second segment. But thank you, everybody, for tuning in and stay tuned. Welcome back to Why Bother, the podcast where we explore why creative makers bother doing things the hard way. I've got Julie Land here with me from Science Cubs, and we're going to keep the chat going Um by the way, if you're tuning in, please do like, subscribe and share the podcast so we can grow our humble little audience with you fine folks. And uh, if you're listening, you can tune in to watch us on YouTube as well uh, and keep an eye on our social media for little clips of upcoming episodes. All right. Fun facts. We like to start this segment with a little fun fact. And you work in stationery and stickers. Did you know that first sticker is reported to be a postage stamp from 1837 from the UK, from from Britain? Uh, but there's some debate over that. That that doesn't seem that long ago. So there's reports of ancient Egypt having paper stuck to the walls to show off prices and stuff at markets that still exist to this day. So stickers obviously go way back, but they've evolved quite a bit. Uh, now it's a bit more of a form of expression. What's what's your journey like with stickers as someone who makes them? For me, I've always collected stickers when I was younger. I had a sticker book. Um, I was a little OCD. I, the first page would be the bumpy stickers. The okay. second page would be scratch and sniff. Nice. You can never mix and match. That's a no, no. <laughs> so I think stickers has always brought me joy in life. Sometimes when I was little and I was sad about something, I just kind of look through my sticker books and stuff. Totally. It's almost like a little journal that you have. Absolutely. Each sticker has like an origin and a story. Someone might yeah. have given it to you. Or you collected it from somewhere, you know, amusement yeah. park or anywhere. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that, you know, a fad for stickers has always been there for me. And that's why I created stickers as well to kind of share that kind of happiness with other people. That's very cool. I remember collecting stickers when I was like, again, like five, six years old. I remember scratch and sniff was like mind blowing. Yeah. What is this technology? <laughs> yeah. Actually, people have asked me if I can make scratch and sniffs. Okay. And I'm looking into it, but no solid manufacturers yet. But I've yeah. been actively looking into it, hoping to find something. Yeah. Um, that's great. Thanks for uh, giving us some background on on your early days in uh, you know getting into the world of art. Uh, let's talk about how your business has evolved. Um, so Science Cobbs, as as we heard, is a side business, you have a day job. Um, if you can tell us a little bit about how those two coexist and, and how Science Cobbs has evolved. So I think as I've mentioned before, Science Cobbs came from a sports injury and I really didn't have a lot of direction on where I wanted to take my doodles. It was throughout a friend that um, she was one who pushed me to kind of make Science Cobbs what it is today. So I think a lot of people, they kind of underestimate the amount of time that goes into running your own business. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of time, sometimes even packing. You think it would take half an hour, but it ends up taking an hour and a half. Right. And so it's definitely um, a struggle sometimes to juggle between a full time job and science cobs. Right. But you kind of just make that happen. You know, you go through your priorities, what needs to be done. And, you know, you kind of predict the future a little bit on, you know, what you might need next week. 
And that versus, you know, work, the workload that you have, you just kind of have to juggle and multitask and keep a planner and be really organized. So you're naturally organized. I guess, yeah, That's naturally good. organized. And you kind of have to like, like your sticker book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. The OCD definitely helps. Yeah. And you kind of have to think in the future. So for science cause, what I didn't realize is you almost have to plan four to six months in advance. Absolutely. Yeah. So what kind of designs will be in in winter? What about next spring? Mm -hmm. Things like that, because it takes time to come up with the designs, to design the design and to produce the design. So all that takes time. Yep. You can't just, you know, have a product on a whim. Yeah, you got to go and market it too. So get it in front of your, if you're selling to stores like Maker House, they need time to order it and yeah. stock it up for the holidays, uh, for example. So that's a really good point. Uh, how did you get into your your field that you work during the day and, and what is your day job? So my day job is a software developer. So oh, I do software cool. automation. Um, I think that does help me a bit because it's a very logical and linear job. So that does help me to plan ahead, especially because I work in the QA. So we always think like, what could go wrong, you know? Oh, interesting. So that kind of helps the science cause as well, because it kind of makes you think of different things and how to troubleshoot them, especially in markets, in places where you, your resource might be limited to what you bring and how to fix things. For example, what if it's really windy or what if, you know, something's running out and what do you put in that spot? And there's right. a lot of little troubleshooting skills that you have to have when you run markets and even like a store, which yeah. I'm sure that you know. <laughs> oh, for sure. There's always day-to-day -day problems or like big fires sometimes that you have to put out. Yeah. Um, so you're a software developer, you work, you code basically. Yeah. Uh, and how, how long have you been doing that? Have you always been into that since like high school? So that's something that I've had interest in in high school and I didn't really know what to pursue coming out of university. And that's just something that just came. <laughs> you were good at it. Yeah, I was good at it yeah. and I was offered a job and I just continued to do it. So for me, I'm actually really happy about Science Cobs because it's just another outlet for me to be creative and for me to connect with people outside of tech, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's good to mix it up. And you seem like someone who who has two, you know, left and right brains, basically, <laughs> where you can you've got the science side, the, the software development uh, and then this creative side of things. Um, so good thing you have science cup to yeah. scratch that. Yeah, edge. it definitely keeps me sane for sure. Yeah, good balance there. Yeah. Tell us about uh, who might be your biggest supporters uh, growing up or getting into business. Uh, is there anyone that comes to mind who you want to shout out or, you know, help push you along? Yeah. So I think when you start your business is really scary. You don't know if people are going to buy your things. I think that's the biggest concern that most people have is, are people going to like my stuff? Yeah. You know, what if it doesn't sell and I spend all this money making it? And I'm very lucky to have friends that support me and give me constructive feedback throughout the process. So for example, Katerina, who lives in Toronto, who runs both view photography, she's the one who pushed me to uh, monetize my doodles to make them into greeting cards. And when I started making them, she was actually my first customer awesome. on Etsy when I saw that. And like the first couple customers were all friends and family. Yeah. So That's how it usually goes. Yeah. You and I remember that push though. Yeah, for sure. And I remember getting my first real customer. Her name is Brianna Silva. She lives in Texas. Yeah. And I was so you happy. You never forget that first customer. You never forget. Yeah. Yeah. So and it kind of just went from there, but it definitely helps to have a strong, I guess, family and friend support to help you. And also for me in the creative process, um, I think that you guys probably encounter that in Maker House as well, is you think that this product is going to sell. You're like, oh, this is so funny. This is I so great. This. I love it. Yeah. And you put it on the shelf and nobody buys it. You're like, why? <laughs> you don't get me. Yeah, you don't get me. I think it's great. <laughs> yeah. So I think that it's also helpful to have a group of friends where you can kind of 
pre-release the designs to right. them and just ask them like what they think of it. And I always tell my family and friends, I said, I'm not going to get offended. You can just tell me if something's crappy. Like, that's not funny. That doesn't make sense. It's yeah. crap. But just please tell me. Give it to me straight. Yeah. Before I get it printed like 500 times, and I can't sell it. <laughs> you know? Good call. So uh, That's actually some really good advice. And it's a segue to our next question, which is as a fairly new entrepreneur, someone who's been doing this for now, I guess, three years. Mm -hmm. uh, what's some advice you might have to other aspiring entrepreneurs who are looking, maybe they also have a nine to five job, but they have a creative dream on the side. So I would suggest to start small. Um, so for me, I started out just making greeting cards. I remember on Etsy, I listed 12 greeting cards and that's all I had. And I remember three being sold out and Etsy actually closed my shop for a while because there was not enough products. Okay. <laughs> so. You started out even too small. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but you were just inching along. Yeah. yeah. And you just start out with, you know, a handful of things. You see what sells and what doesn't. Yeah. And you just kind of go from there because, you know, there's a difference between like a hobby and making it into a business. For a business, it has to be profitable for you to make new things to put into that business. So it's yeah. like a circle. And um, a lot of it, you just have to kind of think about how much money you're putting into it, what sells and what doesn't. So it's more than just create creating something at that point. It's not just like if you build it, they will come. You yeah. need to get that feedback that there's a market for this. People want this design or they don't want that design. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think that shout out to Taylor Swift. I think, you know, whether you like her or not, um, what she said has really resonated with me that she listens to her fans of what they like. So when she puts out an album, she listens to her fans of what song to release as singles. Of course. And I think that's what makes her one of the top artists right now is like she listens to her fans and the people around her. Yeah. So, you know, you have to listen to your loyal customers, repeat buyers. If they tell you, oh, maybe the quality is not great on this thing that you're making, you have to fix that. You have to kind of be humble and listen to people around you and what their feedback totally. is. Totally. It's not really about you. It's about that community you're building. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Taylor, if you're listening, we really, uh, <laughs> Value your work. Uh, we think you're a rising star, and one day you're gonna make it. <laughs> and I hope to see your concert. I've been waiting this <laughs> three times. Come on, Taylor. <laughs> We're all on the wait list here. Yeah. Um, amazing. So, thank you for sharing that great advice. And we're gonna take another quick break, wrap up this segment, and we will be back for one more segment with Julie Land from Science Cobbs. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Why Bother? We're here with Julie Lan. I'm your host, Gareth Davies. Let's get into it. We're doing some fun food sampling to start our last segment. We've got a couple things that Julie selected from the shop here. She's got great taste in food, by the way. That's probably why she also gets to work at a bakery. <laughs> you have three jobs now with the tech, software development, science cobs, and you help out Hello Dolly as well. I do. They're yeah. great. Such a good friend, such a hard worker. <laughs> We've got uh, Bavarian roasted peanuts from our friends at Brittles and More in Waterloo. Thanks for selecting those. We've also got a chocolate bar here from our friends at Truffle Pig in Burnaby, BC. So I'm going to pass you the beer nuts first. And I got some here for myself. Let us know what you think of those. All right. Mm, they look good. <laughs> These are so good. Mm hmm. Yeah, they taste fresh, which is good. Sometimes you buy roasted mm -hmm. nuts in the store and they don't taste as fresh. And it almost tastes like a dessert on its own. <laughs> There's just, like that sweet coating to it. Yeah, you can just snack on them when you're watching TV. So these are honey Bavarian beer nuts. They would go good with a drink, I think. Mm -hmm. Didn't mean to rhyme there, Dr. Seuss style, but um, I'm going to open up our chocolate mm. bar now. <laughs> All right. You're welcome. Oh, I should do some ASMR roasted peanuts, too. <laughs> These are really good. I can't stop eating. <laughs> <laughs> See how they go with this milk chocolate peanut butter bar. You can mm. grab some there. Awesome. Oh, I got the bigger piece. I'm yeah, sorry. That's OK. You deserve the bigger piece. Mmm, <laughs> crunchy peanuts. 
<laughs> That's what you get for listening to our podcast. You're welcome. What do you think of the milk chocolate peanut butter bar? I like it. I like it. It blends really well. It's got like that, you know, solid chocolate outside, but the inside's actually soft. Yeah. So it kind of melts a little bit and slightly crunchy. I mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thank you for trying those. As I mow down the last of my chocolate bar here. Thank you. You were smart. You like paced yourself over I'm there. Have another nut. <laughs> I just <laughs> stuffed it all in my face. <laughs> all right. And for our next question, I'm going to ask you on the personal side of things. We've talked about work. We're tired of talking about work. What's your biggest hobby or passion outside of work? Do you even have time for that? But if you do, you know, what would you choose to do with that time? I love traveling. Oh, yeah. I love traveling. Um, I've always been into traveling. I love the food. I love different cultures. I just love going to places and just seeing how they do things compared to how we do things back home. Some of my favorite places I have been to. um, Egypt was amazing. Their food out of the world. Oh, no way. Yeah. I've never been there. Yeah. Vietnam was good. I'm from Taipei. So I'm actually going back to Taipei in the fall to visit my grandmother. Okay. So you, you grew up in Taiwan and in the Taipei's the capital, right? Yeah. So yeah, I grew up in Taiwan in Taipei and, um, we moved here when I was about 13. Oh, wow. So okay. Taiwan is my home country. And Taipei's I home. didn't know that about you. That's that's incredible. So you moved here. What year? Um, nineteen ninety. Was okay. it the Lion King came out? Mid nineties. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> well, you would remember that because you're going into a whole new culture. So you probably have all these like clear, you know, landmarks almost of of that time in your life. Yeah. Um. And what was that like moving from Taipei over to where? Like, where did you land in Canada? So we moved to Victoria, BC. Okay. Um, when we first moved to Victoria, BC, I didn't speak any English. So I had to learn pretty much how to read, write, speak English here. Wow. Yeah. As a teenager too. So it's not like you were like young when it's super, it's more easy, I think, to learn a new yeah. language. But I think in Victoria, BC at that time, the majority are English speaking. So it was kind of forced an environment where I had to learn yeah. really quick. Yeah. And so, yeah, it didn't take me too long to just learn the basics and then, you know, it takes time to develop it and perfect it. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that I have perfect English or anything, but it did take a while. Probably better than me in (laughs) a lot of ways. Um, And good for you. That would be challenging for your whole family. I'm sure your your parents, you know, being even older, it likely would have been even more challenging for them. Um, Jumping on to our next question. We call this the point of connection. This is all about human connection. A lot of our makers don't just work for you know money or the glory of getting your products out there. There's something deeper. How does human connection play a role in what you do with Science Club? Uh, I think for me is I love working markets because you see people's reaction to your product life. So you see what excites them. You know, sometimes you see little kids, they run up to your table and be like, oh, I love this stuff. Mm. Or, you know, that honestly, that brings a little joy in my heart. Or people are really excited of, you know, stickers or whatever to gift to other people. So it's almost like you're passing down that joy to somebody else. Yeah. yeah. And that's a really good feeling. Yeah. And your stuff is very kid friendly. Um, so I could see that happening at markets. And I love your point about the gifting because often people will see a friend or a relative in your work. It reminds them of someone. Yeah. Uh, and that's like, you want when you're giving a gift you know you want you're kind of looking for inspiration yeah for sure and i saw my greeting cards a bit snarky and stuff so it's really fun to see people getting the same joke as you like the same kind of dark humor you're like "Eh, i get you (laughs) kindred spirits (laughs) yeah amazing so yeah i'm glad you're finding that connection with your work i'm not surprised that lots of people out there relate to your illustrations and the themes and that sassy, snarky side that you uh, you obviously have uh, in your personality that you get to put on paper. Yeah, I think you guys carry one of the cards. It's um, instead of grandkids, can I offer you this card? Yeah. 
Yes. So I send that to my mom every year. <laughs> every year, she gets, <laughs> every year she gets the same card. And um, a lot of times I see, you know, other people that are around the same age. And then they're also excited to see that card and send it to their parents. <laughs> like, oh. Yeah, I love that. I love that you send it to your mom every year. <laughs> And, Out of uh, love. I love my mom. I yeah, love my mom. <laughs> yeah. And she's probably got them all on the, the mantle. Yeah, she and she's is. like, these are my grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> she names them. Uh, amazing. Yeah. All right. So we're going to wrap up with, um, you know, what's the big focus for you this year with Science Cobs? Uh, and where can people find you if they want to follow along? So they can find me at your store, Maker House, for a lot of greeting cards and stickers, as well as across the street if they would like. Hello, yeah. dollies. People can find you in, in person there. What about online? Yeah, online science cobs on Instagram. And um, yeah, go from there. Okay, amazing. Be sure to follow along with Julie at Science Cobs. Super talented. Check out all her illustrations and stationary products and stickers. Get them on your water bottle or your laptop. And thank you so much for tuning into Why Bother. We're happy to have you along with this journey. Be sure to share uh, and and follow and like the podcast so we can keep growing. And uh, stay tuned for our next episode. Thanks for coming on, Julie. Thank you. Bye. Bye.